want to look at the last few historical objections that we cover, and then after that we'll move into the theological objections. It's been said, okay, even if we recognize that the Crusades, Inquisitions, these different things in church history, demonizing the Jews, do not reflect the spirit and teaching of the New Testament, and that there were true Christians who opposed these things and so on. You can't argue with the fact that without the long, ugly history of, of Christian anti-Semitism, the Holocaust would never have occurred. It's true. It's totally true. I do not believe that the atrocities of the Holocaust, which were not just Nazi Germany, but Poland participated, and Hungary participated, and Ukraine participated, and, and other parts of, of Europe participated, that, that there's no way these things could have happened unless there had been a certain Jew hatred in the fabric of much of the society, and that was due to, quote, Christian anti-Semitism. What you have to understand, though, it, it is an Anglo phenomenon. You, you do not find this equivalent in African Christianity. You do not find this equivalent in Asian Christianity. You do not find this equivalent in, in Latin American Christianity. It, it is primarily an, an Anglo phenomenon. And especially uh, countries, uh, you, you may find more of this in a Latin context because of European connections. But in, in an Asian context, in an African context, and there's been the history of Christianity in some of these countries for centuries and centuries. Uh, India, according to tradition back to the Apostle Thomas in the first century. Egypt, an ancient community of, of, of Christians go, going back to the very earliest stages of the gospel spreading in the ancient world. These, these things are unheard of in terms of these types of atrocities against the Jews. So what's, what's my point? The point is simply this, that this took place in certain soil and it connected with the church breaking away from Jewish roots and the Bible in many, many ways. So it was a hypocritical church, a church that had largely departed from Jewish roots, a, a church that could be complicit with the murder of Jews, has nothing to do with the New Testament and is localized in a particular part of the world. So yes, without a doubt, Without this history of, of so-called Christian anti-Semitism, the Holocaust would never have occurred. Absolutely. And it's deplorable and it's horrific, but it's completely aberrant, as we have underscored time and time again. You say, yeah, okay, hang on. The Holocaust, the Holocaust itself. How, how could that have happened? And, and we're not even going to talk about Jesus until we deal with the Holocaust. Now, in truth... That's not a Jewish objection specifically, is it? In other words, that's not a Jewish objection to Yeshua. That's a Jewish question about God in general. But let's think about it. Let's think about how we treat the question of the Holocaust. I asked one of my friends, a counter-missionary rabbi who lives in New Jersey, in the community in which you live, does the average religious Jew there connect the Holocaust with Christianity? He said, oh, absolutely, absolutely. So that perception exists so we, we need to look at this larger question of the Holocaust. And let, let me step back and say that the Jewish scholars have often reflected on this as well, far more than Christian scholars. They've reflected on the Holocaust and how could it happen and where was God? Stephen Katz, writing for Encyclopedia Judaica in 1975, reflected some of the current streams of thought that, that were, were being discussed by Jewish scholars in this day. One, the Holocaust is like all of the tragedies and merely raises again the question of theodicy, God and the problem of suffering, the problem of evil, but does not significantly alter the problem or contribute anything new to it. In other words, there have been absolutely horrific, mind-numbing, mind-boggling tragedies of human beings doing horrific things to other human beings. The Holocaust is no one of those. How could there be a good God and an evil world? Same question. Uh, another Jewish response was the classical Jewish theological doctrine of mipnei chata'enu, because of our sins we were published, which, which was evolved in the face of earlier national calamities and can also be applied to the Holocaust. According to this account, Israel was sinful and Auschwitz is her just reward. This is mipnei chata'enu. 
Now, many Jews today recoil at that, even the thought of it. But there were traditional Jews, as the Nazis in Germany began to take power and began to pass their anti-Semitic laws and persecute Jews, there were traditional rabbis saying, this is, this is what we deserve. Because there were Reformed Jews in our very cities. There were German Jews who were fighting against our tradition, and they kept their, their businesses open on the Sabbath, and they violated Jewish tradition and Jewish laws. So now we're being shut down. Now we're being persecuted. We deserve it. It's because of our sins. And many Jews find that an absolutely horrific concept. I just want to say that Jewish scholars and some traditional Jews to this day say the Holocaust was divine punishment for Jewish sin. I'm not the one making that statement. I'm quoting some traditional rabbis who said that. Number three, the Holocaust is the ultimate and vicarious atonement. Israel is the suffering servant of Isaiah, chapter 53, for example. She suffers and atones for the sins of others. Some die so that others might be cleansed and live. That's interesting. We'll, we'll come back to that concept of the atoning power, death of the righteous, a, a few classes from now. Number four, again, this is Jewish historian Stephen Katz discussing different Jewish responses to the Holocaust that were current as of 1975. The Holocaust is a modern akedah, the sacrifice of Isaac. It is a test of our faith. Number five, the Holocaust is an instance of the temporary eclipse of God. There are times when God is inexplicably absent from history or unaccountably chooses to turn his face away. Number six, the Holocaust is proof that God is dead. If there were a God, he would surely have prevented Auschwitz. If he did not, then he does not exist. Number seven, the Holocaust is the maximization of human evil. The price mankind has to pay for human freedom. The Nazis were men, not gods. Auschwitz reflects ignominiously on man. It does not touch on God's existence or perfection. Number eight, the Holocaust is revelation. It issues a call for Jewish affirmation. From Auschwitz comes the command, Jews survive. Number nine, the Holocaust is an inscrutable mystery. Like all of God's ways, it transcends human understanding and demands faith and silence. Uh, some... Yeshiva students and their rabbis in Israel put a compilation together. They suggested five reasons. Some of them overlap with the ones we just gave. Again, just think about Jewish reflections on the Holocaust. Uh, Hester Panim, hiding of the face. In order for God to allow real freedom of choice, he restrains himself from intervening in human affairs. So to a certain extent, he'll allow evil to go on so that uh, people will, will turn to him and or have freedom of choice, even if it results in tragedy. Uh, another, the Holocaust and redemption. According to this approach, the lack of proportion between the sin and its punishment is explained by the end of the exile and the establishment of the state of Israel. In other words, out of this horrific suffering, w which was deserved, but not nearly on that level, comes redemption, the birth of the state of Israel. Birth pangs of the Messiah, that these are final tribulations and pangs and upheavals before Messiah comes. Number four, fate and mission. Uh, Dr. Yona Ben Sasson sees the explanation to the Holocaust not in the context of sin and punishment, but as a necessary disruption of Jewish existence and as an imperative for the Jewish mission. And then again, because of our sins, and why were Jews punished? Well, you observe the Torah and Jewish traditions, seeking to establish the state of Israel before the Messiah's coming, and so on. Or failing to heed the warnings of Jewish Zionists who urged their people to come to the land before the destruction broke out in Europe. Uh, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and, and, and Rabbi Z.Y. Cook, a prominent Israeli thinker, suggest this, that the Holocaust is to be explained as a healing process, a divine surgery and treatment performed on the body of the nation in preparation for its salvation. In the words of Rabbi Schneerson, with all the horrifying pain of this tragedy, it is clear that no evil comes from heaven and that with the very evil and suffering of the afflictions, a sublime spiritual good is embodied. The Holy One, blessed be he, is that professor surgeon did everything he did for good. In the words of Rabbi Cook, a deep and hidden internal treatment of the cleansing of impurity was what the Holocaust was about. Now, again, a problem of that is that many Jews who suffered in the Holocaust were religious Jews. 3 million out of 3.3 million Polish Jews, 90% of Polish Jews were slaughtered in the Holocaust. And a large number of them, a large percentage of them were religious Jews. So 
we see the Jewish seeking, struggling, trying to come up with answers. And it's, it's an agonizingly difficult question. Uh, and the idea that Jews are suffering for their sins is something that, that say, Nobel laureate Eli Wiesel would reject wholeheartedly when asked, well, maybe it's the covenant curses. Maybe it's, you know, Jews rejected the Torah in Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. Wouldn't think about it. And yet Elie Wiesel said that, that many Jews upon, upon first entering a concentration camp felt this. If I'm here, it is because God is punishing me. I have sinned and I am expiating my sins. I have deserved this punishment that I am suffering. You know, all this bad is happening. I must have done something wrong. Many Jews felt that in the Holocaust when they were brought into the concentration camps. But does that explain it? Was Jewish guilt so much more severe then than at other times in history? And if it was payback for Jews rejecting Jesus, why 1900 years later? So very, very difficult to come up with theological answers. Alexander Donat, who survived both the Warsaw Ghetto and the concentration camps, said, what had we done to deserve this hurricane of evil, this avalanche of cruelty? Why had all the gates of hell opened and spewed forth on us the furies of human vileness? What crimes had we committed for which this might have been calamitous punishment? Where, in what code of morals, human or divine, is there a crime so appalling that innocent women and children must expiate it with their lives and martyrdoms no Torquemada, the Grand Inquisitor, ever dreamed of? And there's the, the famous dictum of Rabbi Irving Greenberg, he says, God comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable, whereas the devil comforts the comforted and afflicts the afflicted. And he said, moreover, sum up the principle that no statement should be made that could not be made in the presence of the burning children. If you're going to give an explanation for the Holocaust, be able to give it in the presence of little babies being thrown into fiery pits and burned alive by the Nazis, Jewish babies. He said, on this rock, the traditionalist argument, namely that the Holocaust was a divine judgment, breaks. Tell the children in the pits that they're burning for their sins. An honest man, better a decent man, would spit at such a God rather than accept this rationale if it were true. If this justification is loyalty, then surely treason is the honorable choice. If this were the only choice, then surely God would prefer atheism. Now, now frankly, there are Jews who suffered in, in history say in the Babylonian exile in 586, Jews who were killed, butchered with the destruction of Jerusalem at that time. And, you know, the prophet said it was because of Jewish sin. What do we say to that? There were babies who were killed, babies who were slaughtered by the Babylonians ruthlessly. Jewish men, women, and children ripped apart, Jewish women raped. And the prophet said it was because of sin. And then the Lamentations, the people confessed through the prophet it was because of sin. And yet to say that babies were thrown into burning pits at Auschwitz because of Jewish sin, how, how can we say that? Doesn't that go beyond anything written in the covenantal curses and, and the Torah? So we think of this and, and the answers that we come up with in many ways are inadequate. So, so now I, I want to come at this from a different angle. I want to come at this from the angle of the gospel and to point us to Jesus Yeshua as the very Messiah we need. In other words, as we reflect on the horrors of the Holocaust, and I have friends who, who lost basically, well, their parents lost all their family in the Holocaust. And they described some of just the horror stories. I don't know how, how human beings survived after those things. And, and yet our people persevered, and others persevered after horrific suffering. L let me come at this from a different angle. First, first this. <clears throat> We see the level of human evil in the Holocaust. We see the horrific things that human beings could do to fellow human beings. Now, similar things happened at different times in history, just not with this particular scope. But if, if you look uh, percentage-wise at the devastation of the nation of Cambodia under Pol Pot, how several million Cambodians were systematically tortured and slaughtered, in the, in the most horrific ways, and with the complicity and, and the active involvement of many of the people, or the horrific massacre when, when there was violence in Rwanda some years back, internal violence, and just in a matter of days, tens of thousands and tens of thousands slaughtered one against another. Yeah, it's diff different than the systematic 
horrors of the Holocaust, but it's equally shocking. Look at what human beings could do. And on and on it goes. Uh, Stalin probably responsible for the death of 20 million. Chairman Mao, when you look at starvation and things like that caused by his policies, could be responsible for deaths of 40 or 50 or 60 million Chinese. Here's what this points to. It points to the depths of human evil. The depths of human evil. And to just say, well, human beings can repent and come back to God. No, it doesn't answer this. If human beings can get that low, we need supernatural redemption. If human beings can get that low, we we need a God who reaches that low into our world. That's what the cross tells us. That the human species, the human race, with all the good that we're capable of doing, ultimately we fail miserably. If left to ourselves, we would destroy each other. Has it ever dawned on you that we spend so much of our budget here in America on the military? And you go to a country like Israel and it spends a far higher percentage of its budget on the military. Why? Just to keep other people from killing us, killing them. And that if we didn't have the nuclear bombs that we did, and other countries didn't have the nuclear bombs that we, the one who had them probably blow up everybody else or hold everybody else hostage. Human beings, if left to themselves, will self-destruct. We need a redeemer. We need, we need something more than a religion that tells us the right thing to do. We need a savior who comes into our midst and goes to the lowest dregs of human society and dies a criminal's death to take on himself what we've done. I'll share in a later lecture how that is exactly what the prophets spoke of and even in keeping with some beautiful Jewish tradition. Uh, there is a reform rabbi Ignaz Maybaum who suggested that the Holocaust represented the crucifixion of the Jewish people. And through its suffering, a, a, a turning of, of world sympathy towards the Jews. Now there was much more Jew, world sympathy towards the Jews 50 years ago than there is today. Jewish hatred, or, or hatred I should say, of the Jews, anti-Semitism, Jew hatred exists now in, in levels just as high as before the Holocaust. And it's been like that for some years around the world. So whatever sympathy was created once the state of Israel was birthed and the state of Israel became strong, the old Jew hatred was back in venomous power. But but what about this idea that somehow it parallels the crucifixion? There there are a lot of similar thoughts, but you see there's something about the crucifixion of Messiah that, that goes further. And with that, let me introduce you to a Christian voice. She was known as Dr. Clara Schlink, a German woman, opposed the Nazis, uh, reached out to Muslims. Oh, she did not avoid controversy. And after the Holocaust, she founded the Evangelical Sisterhood of Mary, a Lutheran Christian woman. In 1958, she wrote these words. How are the Jews to believe in Jesus? Have not we ourselves blindfolded them? They cannot see Jesus because of our conduct. They cannot believe in him because in our own lives we've not presented to them the image of Jesus. Rather, we have shown them the image of mercilessness. Your deeds in Germany talk so loud that I cannot hear your words, a Jew of our time comments. Our words about Jesus must cut Jews to the heart considering the cruelties we have perpetrated against them in the name of this Jesus from the time of the Crusades up to the present day. And not only that, How many acts of love have we neglected to do? Thus we share in the horrible guilt of our people in murdering six million Jews. This guilt still hovers over us us like a cloud. She wrote this in 1958. For her, as a German Christian, can't go on with life as usual. Can we Germans really continue to walk under the open sky of our fatherland in daytime in the sunshine and at night beneath the stars, enjoying it all without feelings of shame? Must we not remember that not long ago under the same sky in the midst of our people, gigantic flames ascended from the burning bodies of millions of people day and night? Were not these flames like a cry of desperation and a raised finger of accusation? She says, we Germans were Satan's henchmen. She said, we are personally to blame. We all have to admit that if we, the entire Christian community, had stood up as one man and if if after the burning of the synagogues on Kristallnacht, we had gone out on the streets and voiced our disapproval, ringing the church bells, 
somehow boycotted the actions of the SS, the devil's vassals would probably not have been at such liberty to pursue their evil schemes. Well, how can we look now at German children playing happily and not think of the many, many thousands of children who screamed in anguish and terror when they were burnt alive, when they, either with or without their parents, choked to death in the gas chambers? And, and, and then she says this. It may turn out that Jesus finds his likeness in Israel and not in us. What? She's saying that, that Jesus can identify more with the Jews who are suffering than with these Christians, so-called Christians, who are involved in the death of these Jews. She said that, that they have the marks of the suffering servant just like Yeshua. Isn't this interesting? Now, think of this. Think of this. C consider despised German Jew. He's stripped naked. He's humiliated in, in front of, of others. And, and then he, he's, he's beaten to death. And now think of Yeshua hanging naked on the cross as the Romans would have crucified him, dying for the sins of the world. Now that Jew in, in Nazi Germany, no matter how religious a man he was, was still not perfect, but Yeshua was perfect. And here he is, beaten almost to death, and then hanging naked on the cross where he will die, Say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Meaning, you have given me over to this. And drawing our attention to Psalm 22, a text that we will return to. Elie Wiesel talks about a horrific scene, one of the more horrific scenes in the midst of the horrors of the Holocaust. He, he spoke of a, a young Jewish boy, a sad-eyed angel, who died an agonizingly slow death on the gallows in front of the whole concentration camp. He was hung, but he, he was so light that he just, his neck wouldn't break and he just kept twitching in agony and it went on and on and on. And someone yelled out, where is God now? Let the boy die and God intervene. Stop his suffering. Where is God now? And from deep within, Wiesel hears this cry. Where is he? Here he is. He's hanging here on this gallows. Ah, but think of this. That was a metaphorical thought, insight that Elie Wiesel had, but of course it was not true. Think of this, here is Yeshua hanging on the cross, dying for the sins of Israel and the world, taking our place, suffering things that we, did, that we deserve that he did not deserve. We the human race deserve that he did not deserve. And someone says, where is God now? There he is hanging on the cross. God's word, God's expression, God's image made flesh. And what do we do as a human race? We crucify him. We give him over to death. Where's God? There he is, hanging on the cross, hanging on that tree, being brutalized for us. You see, rather than looking at the Nazi persecutors or the victorious crusaders who marched through Europe to destroy Jews and marched to the Holy Land to liberate the Holy Land from Muslims and Jews and so on, we need to look to the image of the cross because Jesus did not come with a triumphant sword. But rather, he, he told his people, put down the sword, take up your cross, and follow me. And we need to recognize we, we have a Savior that we can identify with. We were hated, he was hated. We were rejected, he was rejected. We were persecuted, he was persecuted. We were maligned and falsely accused, he was maligned and falsely accused. We were beaten to death and killed, he was beaten to death and killed. Yet he was perfect, and he did it all willingly. He came into the world for that very purpose can identify with him and he can identify with us rather than thinking of him as some foreigner or some foreign God. Look at him as this great high priest who understands our sufferings having come into our world and who says, come to me, all you who are, are heavy burdened and, and weighed down and struggling with the burden of life and the pain of this world and the weight of sin. He says, come to me and find rest. So he himself takes our sins and carries them on his own shoulders to the cross and says, Father, I'll pay for the sin of the human race and I'll bring relief to the world through my suffering. He will return as a triumphant king. But right now he's a, he's a Messiah that we Jews who've suffered so much through our history, we can relate to him. He's just the Messiah we need. He came into our world as a Jew, suffered as a Jew, and offers us redemption as Jews. We'll begin with theological objections when we resume.